here we go. Now we're sh we're recording. Um, if everyone's okay with that, and um, I also want to um, give you the opportunity to, since this is a recording that will be available to others to view, if you would like to remain off camera, that's totally fine. Uh, Natasha, are are we going to ask them to just put their name and organization, or were you able to gather everyone that's logged in and know who they're where they're from? Um, I was going to ask that. Yeah, actually. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, thank you for yeah, bringing sorry. that up. So Debbie um, brought up a really good point. Uh, everyone who's here on the call, if you wouldn't mind putting um, your name and your organization that you work for in the chat, that way we know who's attended um, and it'll make it easier for us too if uh, we need to reach out and answer some questions. So if you feel comfortable doing that, please put your name and organization in the chat. And uh, I myself, I'm Natasha Doye. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm with the Human Services Department at Snohomish County in the Office of Community and Homeless Services. And I'm working on this specific funding, um, uh, specifically for the by and for organizations. I started with the county in January, and I have a background in human services and public health. Um, and then Debbie, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Sure. I'm Debbie Trosvig, uh, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the supervisor for the Office of Community and Homeless Services in the Stomish County Human Services Department. And our team um, does uh, most of the homeless housing funding that comes in through the state um, and federal funding sources. Um, we do most of the subrecipient subcontracting with local nonprofits. And we also do um, strategic planning around ending homelessness in Stomish County and are the staff support for our continuum of care in the work that the Partnership to End Homelessness does. All right, and so for today, um, what we're going to be doing is we're gonna go over some information that should help you um, better determine whether or not this funding is a good fit for you and your organization. So we're gonna start with some um, definitions. So I'm going to define what a by and for organization is. Um, I'm also gonna define what homelessness prevention is. Um, the services that qualify for homelessness prevention, uh, the program expenses that qualify, and then what the eligibility requirements are going to be for the folks that you serve. Um, and then Debbie's going to go over some reporting requirements, um, kind of high level uh, with the HMIS system and invoicing. And she's also going to go over a funding example um, that just kind of gives you an idea of what it might look like with your organization. Um, then I'm going to go over an application timeline, give you some important dates for next workshops and um, when the RFP is going to be released and when the applications are due. And then we're also going to have time for questions at the end. Um, like I said, feel free to unmute yourself at any point during the slideshow to ask us questions, um, but we'll also have time at the end for more questions as well. All right, and so let's get started. Um, by and for organizations um, are defined by the Washington State Department as, of Commerce as organizations that are operated by and for the community that they serve. So the primary mission and history of those organizations is culturally based in the community that they serve, and it's substantially controlled by individuals from the population that they serve. Um, these communities may include ethnic and racial minorities, immigrants and refugees, individuals who identify as LGBTQ+, individuals with disabilities or who are deaf, and Native Americans. So this definition comes from the Department of Commerce because the funding for this um, comes through the system demonstration grant and then through um, the Department of Commerce. And so the definition that we're working through is that definition. Does anybody have any 
questions about what a buy-in for organization is? Um, just kind of quickly, a couple of things, Natasha. Is this, uh, are you going to be able to share this? Yes, yes. Um, I will share the recording of this on our website. I will also share um, the slides as well. Um, and so those will be available. Um, and the website, um, let's see. I will put the website in the chat in uh, a few minutes. Perfect. And I, I think the only other thing I was uh, we're just wondering is like, what does controlled by individual, like what does that mean? Yes, that's a good question. So um, controlled means that leadership in the organization would be from the same community that they serve, or if the organization is led by a board, that the majority of the membership on the board is also um, community members. So the idea is the people who are being served by the organization are also in leadership positions within the organization. And the wording is substantially controlled. So, um, you know, that's, it's, it's a little ambiguous, but it means like, you know, mostly. All right, any other questions? Oh, sorry. I was just saying thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, second definition that we'll go over, just to make sure that it works for your guys' organization. Oh, did I go too far? No, okay. Is homelessness prevention. And so homelessness prevention is to prevent households from experiencing homelessness. So the point of this funding is to support households that are at imminent risk of homelessness to obtain stable housing or to avoid experiencing homelessness. Um, so the services that would qualify under this funding for homelessness prevention are housing focused case management, temporary rent payments and other housing costs such as past rent, utility payments and past utility payments. And to give you guys more of an example, we have a list of different services that do qualify. Um, and so, like I said, uh, rent payments, uh, any combination of first and last month rent, um, rent arrears, which are missed rent payments, either full or partial, um, and then, you know, lot rent for RV or manufactured homes, cost of parking spaces when it's connected to the rental unit, landlord incentives, um, security deposits for households moving into new units, uh, utilities that are included in rent, and other fees such as administration fees. Um, also utility payments, utility back payments or arrears, utility deposits, application fees, background checks, credit checks, um, any of those um, fees that are required for someone moving into a new housing situation. Um, the services that do not qualify are ongoing rent and utility payments for subsidized housing, cable deposits or services, or mortgage assistance and utility assistance for homeowners. So this is focused towards renters, not homeowners. Any questions about homelessness prevention or any of the services that would or wouldn't qualify? Okay. So next I'm gonna talk about program expenses that would qualify. So these are for your organization, expenses for your organization that are directly related to and attributable to the homelessness prevention services. So this would be like intake and assessments, um, housing stability services, housing search and placement services, outreach services for this program, mediation and outreach to property owners and landlords, um, data collection and entry, which is connected to the HMIS system, um, and 
then uh, general liability insurance and automobile insurance that's directly related to this program. Um, salaries and benefits for staff that are directly related to the program, as well as you know, office space, utility supplies, and equipment that are directly related to this program. All right, um, next we're going to go over eligibility requirements, unless anyone has any questions about program services. Okay, um, so eligibility requirements. There's two requirements, two basic requirements. The first one is that um, the household must be at risk of homelessness. So there's multiple different criteria for someone to qualify as being at risk of homelessness, but most of the folks that we are focusing on would be people who miss rent payments or utility payments, um, who have received some kind of notice, some kind of eviction notice. Um, also, uh, people who are living in the home of another because of economic hardship, they would qualify as well. Um, but specifically, the services that would qualify would be the services related to getting them into a new place. Um, so it would it would be required that they would the payments would go towards getting them into a new place of their own. Um, And then the second eligibility criteria is that the combined household income must not exceed 80% of the area median income. Um, and so I went on the HUD website and I pulled out the area median income for Snohomish County. Um, so in the little table at the bottom, you'll see that the top row is the number of people in the household. And the bottom row is the actual amount that is 80% of area median income. So for instance, if it's an individual person in a household, they would have to make less than $66,750, which is a fair amount um, with our, un our other funding. So the general population and the young adult funding, the requirement is more restrictive. Um, this requirement is what comes from the Washington State Department of Commerce. And so we decided to keep it um, with the standards and requirements from the Department of Commerce, and then leaving it up to the individual organizations who receive the funding to decide if they want to narrow that. And then I will pass it off to Debbie. Thanks, Natasha. So again, um, appreciate Natasha putting this together. It's an opportunity for us to share with you kind of before the RFP comes out, right, of what's, what the requirements and expectations are um, for this funding. And so you can start to be thinking about it. So when it comes out, you know, you'll you, we can even answer questions ahead of time. So I'm going to now get to the point where like, if you were funded, what that might look like and what the expectations would be. So for reporting requirements, probably one of the most important, important aspects of that is invoicing and getting payments to you and getting the funding to you. Um, so the county requires that you invoice um, monthly. Um, depending on how these funds flow out, we do have um, the opportunity to discuss with you whether um, you would invoice more frequently than that. That's not the standard with the county, but we're always open to discussions. If there is cash flow issues or something, we might be able to have that discussion, but typically um, agencies invoice us monthly. Um, with the um, So if you assume an annual contract, the invoices for the first month and the 12th month must include all backup documentation to support that invoice. Um, depending on um, the funding source and the, the county's experience with the um, agency, um, and if there's any, um, we haven't contracted with an agency before, or if there's an existing agency and there's potentially been some concerns or issues, we can request um, intermediate um, backup on invoices as well. But at a minimum, we always request all the backup documentation for the first and 12th month. Um, 
And the intent is really that the expectation is that the subcontractors maintain monthly backup documentation for all the invoices that you just don't have to submit it. Because at any time, the county or the or the state of Washington can request um, on-site review of your backup documentations for the invoices to support the costs you build the county. So, um, so that's a requirement. Um, what that means as far as, I'll go on what that backup documentation is in a second, but um, when the staff review the invoices, we look to make sure the expenses and the amounts um, requested are consistent with what are in your budget in your contract. And if there's anything questionable, then staff would reach out and ask additional information or documentation. Um, as far as what backup documentation is, um, we typically require a general ledger um, which is kind of the agency's, your general ledger that kind of provides a summary of all your financial tra transactions that have occurred during that pay period or that pay, I'm not trying to say pay, that period that's, that you're submitting the invoice for. Um, the general ledger should align with and support the documents that you're, um, that you have submitted. In addition to the general ledger, we request, we require source documentation. So for instance, that can be if you're purchasing goods, um, supplies and services, um, like you, there's phone bills or utility bills for your agency or supplies you've purchased, that's actual invoices or receipts that um, you've incurred those costs. Um, for um, if there's staffing that you're billing, that would actually be um, a timesheet that reflects the time the person worked on this program. So um, it would show the dates and hours worked um, and it would be able that we could um, connect the staff person to this program. Tom? I wanted to ask, um, do, you, do you anticipate, are you open to the idea of using a bill back template? I've, um, we participate in some other county programs and the bill back template was kind of nice because they set up, you know, it kind of comes with a standardized format. You still have to get all your backup, but I mean, to for form and format, so you're getting the same thing from everybody regarding what you want for general ledger and and tracking to uh, the bullet to tracking to the billing um, codes. I have never seen that. What what may I ask? What department um, that's in? Maybe, um, I think Marisol could maybe share it with you. We're doing um, we're working with the Advancing Health Literacy Project with um, the County Health Department and. Um, there's, I think there's another one too, but they've both kind of been, it seems like they've kind of been using these billback templates because you have to, you know, bill salaries to a certain code item potentially related to the funding. So um, it, it was kind of easy for us because that way we were set up where we knew that, you know, this was our budget amount per time. And then there were like 12 tabs for the year. And, you know, you could kind of, you submit your monthly billing off of each each monthly page and it gives you it gives you a running total of where your map where your budget's at so it's it's yeah it's we, kind of helpful if you don't have you know big accounting systems like we like we don't <laughs> interesting i'd really love to have a follow-up with you on that because i'm not familiar with it you know um the health district just recently became part of us <laughs> of um um but they may have something different but yeah I'd, I'd be really curious to see that um we do have templates like on invoicing type um you know an invoice that keeps track of um how much you've billed to date how much the contract is but it's this, it sounds like that's a little different and i'd be really curious to see what that is yeah i think it was kind of similar to what you were talking about but it you know it kind of gives you the categories because i guess you have to build labor to labor lines and you yes, know, supplies yes, and yeah. stuff like that and that yeah. was, it kind of kept us it i found it helpful for us you know obviously yeah. if you if you mess up the formulas it gets kind of weird so you got to pay attention but anyway i was just kind of curious because it rather than you getting back you know 10 different types of formats every month you get the yeah. standardized report with all the backup yeah yeah we have some standardized i didn't even think to go into that much detail um what's what's um which will probably be helpful is um typically the budget forms we use in the application process um mirror very closely to what the budget forms and our contracts look like and so um as Natasha hinted at, um, we're going to have additional technical ass assistance sessions once the RFP is released. And one of the sessions is specifically on the budget. So you'll get to see that template. Um, and um, it aligns really closely with what our invoices look like. Yeah, great question. Um, 
So that's um, the first uh, reporting requirement is just invoicing. So I just you know wanted to get out there. The expectation is um, backup documentation, monthly invoicing. Um, typically, uh, we ask for invoices by the 10th. Um, we have an internal um, cutoff day that, for instance, if invoices were in by today on the 26th, those um, that check typically then gets cut to the agency on May 5th. So that's how long a turnaround time it takes. Um, and that would be like the, the invoice was approved by staff by today. So today is kind of a cutoff um, in the county for people receiving funds by May 5th. So there's there's definitely some time it takes for us to process it. So um, it's really important that invoices get in on time so staff have time to review them. Um, the, the invoices that come in the second month through the 11th month typically go directly to our fiscal staff, do not require backup documentation always, and are paid um, turn, the turnarounds much more quickly as long as the budget um, line items align with what's in the contract and don't get sent back to staff for, for review, but um, monthly invoicing. So I think next is reporting continued. So as um, Natasha mentioned, um, we uh, use the Homeless Management Information System, which is HMIS, um, to report um, program and client level data. This is a requirement um, by Commerce. Um, HMIS is required at the federal level and um, Department of Commerce also requires HMIS. And these programs are all required. This, this funding is required by Commerce to um, utilize HMIS. If you're not familiar with it, um, most people refer to it as from with the acronym um, as HMIS, but it is a management information system. It's basically a database um, that collects information at the agency level um, as required by funding sources. So um, who are the HMIS users? They're you. It's your staff who input the data. Um, you collect the data. You can you can actually do some queries and reports, and then um, you re, you use HMIS to report information on your clients that you're serving. Um, we actually have um, HMIS admin staff at the county. It's our county HMIS team, and they will work with you to onboard your staff and train them and provide support in HMIS. If you don't have an, if you've never, if your agency um, has never used HMIS, has a, like users in it, um, you actually have to have an agreement with our county in order to operate it. And um, we will, again, we will uh, walk you through that process. Um, it's not required in order to apply for the funds, but just to be clear, the expectation and requirement is that you do use it if you are funded. Um, uh, even though HMIS is a, a national requirement, um, there are a variety of vendors um, that actually have HMIS software. And so our county's HMIS vendor is ClientTrack. So if you were to Google HMIS vendors, you would see there's probably, I don't know, 20. There's probably five to 10 that are the big ones that most communities use. Um, um, but there's a lot of different vendors um, for HMIS and we use client track. It is a web-based um, database and can only be used by users um, that are um, that are specified to use it. Um, and they have to have like a secured and approved workstations. Again, our HMIS um, admin team would work with your agency to support um, you and using HMIS. It, it probably sounds a lot scarier than it is, um, but it's a really important tool that allows us not only to um, get data at an agency level, but it rolls up into our community and at a system level, we're able to analyze and look at how our system is working. Let's see, I think I have one more slide on HMIS because I couldn't. Um, so what is required? So again, commerce requires, we use HMIS and all the agencies um, that receive these funds utilize HMIS. Um, there are requirements that you know that you complete um, the um, required um, information in HMIS. There's timeliness 
of data, they they ask that you have that data put in on at the client level within so many days. Um, part of that is to ensure accuracy and consistency. There, so there is a lot of data and support around exactly what needs to be entered, what's the definitions of those um, different um, fields that need to be entered. Um, I'm, I'm going to mention this, and I'm hoping I'm not make, starting more confusion than, than needs to, but um, there is um, coordinated entry also uses HMIS. I just want to bring this up just in case someone's familiar with this, but it's actually kind of think of it as, as a different workflow. Um, it's the same software system, but HMS, the program level, is different than the workflow that coordinated entry does to put um, to enter individuals and households into coordinated entry. Um, it's a completely different workflow. And even if your agency um, used coordinated entry, um, you would have to have different users and different training to be in the program side of HMIS. So I just want to bring that up because um, sometimes people hear coordinated entry or HMIS and they think they're the same thing and they are different. Um, there are also some requirements around personal, personally identified information in HMIS. So there's um, a lot of rules and regulations around that, obviously, because we want to um, keep information safe. And um, Washington State has some of the strictest um, laws about um, informed consent about um, an, a client opting in to have their data put into HMIS. And there's rules and, and protocols around that if they choose not to. So um, there's a lot of rules and regulations, um, but it's, it's something that's been supporting the work in our county and other communities across the nation for several years now. And a lot of the bugs are worked out. It's not perfect, but um, we're here to support you on it. And it is a required element. So we do want to give um, agencies a heads up before this funding that this is a required element. I think my next and last, oh, Tom, go ahead. Question, um, as this is a required element, is this something we have to contract for independently? Um, how do we, you know, do you have any guidance on how we would budget for that? Yeah, uh, so, you, yeah, great. There's no cost to be in the system, just so you know. Um, it's a free access, um, as so to speak. There are obviously there's staffing costs right to entering in the data and as um, Natasha mentioned that's an eligible um, line item, so you could um, definitely um, bill your time to this grant for entering in your clients into HMIS. Thank you. But there's no um, hard costs or you know software costs for you. It would all it's all free of charge web based. Thank you. So Natasha asked me, or we we talked together. I'm not trying to throw, you know, put her on the spot. Well, we talked about what might be helpful in this um, first uh, info session, and so I kind of wanted to kind of go over like an example of what an award might be. This is, you know, I you know what I just oh it does say example. We should put big, you know, a watermark example because um, I wouldn't really want to be cautious. By no means is this a recommended funding example. This is really just to throw something out there, so to give you an idea, um, we have about oh Natasha, help me here. Is it like one point something million available? I think give or take. Ah! Sorry, I can probably pull it up. Um, I know, hit do four times 285, 500, Natasha. That's how much we have. So I just took about a fourth of it. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, these prevention dollars came from Commerce. They're specifically for um, homelessness prevention. Um, Commerce um, required that at least 10% of our award um, into our community go to buy-in for organizations. Um, we decided as a county to put 15% as a starting point into buy-in for. And then at that point, so yeah, 1.14, um, $1,142,000 will be approximately in this RFP that we have coming out. So um, what we did is um, we, um, we did 15%. Uh, Towards buy-in for organizations, we are set. We set aside around um, about half of that 
for young adult youth and young adult populations and the remainder um was to is to go towards more of the general population and i say that is um potentially anyone that would be served through the young adult population or by a buy in for there's no reason they couldn't go through the general population um i wish i had a better term for it but it's really just anybody um and um, we we had an RFP process earlier this year. Um, we're very close to having the awards announced. Um, but in that RFP, um, one um, young adult provider is being selected and one general population provider is being selected. And the full amount of those awards are going to those two, those set asides are going to those two providers. Um, we made that determination to only have one um, app, um, one uh, provider for those two funding pots um, because of some of the requirements from the state. Specifically, um, uh, those two populations must use coordinated entry in order to receive prevention services. The Department of Commerce has waived the requirement for buy-in for organizations to use coordinated entry for this pot of funds. And so um, we are going to have to do a lot of coordination on the general population, including young adults, in order to make sure we're not having a duplication of services. And so um, we felt it was best to have a sole provider doing that. On the buy-in for pot of funds, since especially since um, coordinated entry isn't required, we felt the flexibility of allowing multiple agencies be awarded this fund was a better way to go. So we will um, potentially, there will be awards to multiple agencies out of this RFP that's coming out. So just to clarify, just in case you go online and see a different, um, see our earlier homeless prevention RFP, um, there will be some differences between the general population and young adult and the buy-in for. Um, so the first one being that um, multiple agencies may receive it. And then as Natasha alluded to in the eligibility screening, um, we are using the broadest eligibility screening that um, Commerce has given us for this um, buy-in for um, organization RFP. For our more general population and young adults, we are actually um, proposing a more tightened screening criteria. And so the income limits will be a little lower and the criteria for me, the definition of at risk of homelessness will be a little tighter. Um, it was our determination that we did not have enough data and information to support um, tightening the requirements for the, these pots of funds. So we were in it with you together and we want to work with you to develop what works for your organization and the community you're serving. Um, similarly, I hinted at um, data and performance under the reporting requirements. Um, Commerce has not come out with set performance guidelines for these fund sources. They are leaving it at the discretion for now at the, at the county level. Um, and saying that they want to see the data coming in and see what performance is looking at before they set requirements. And so again, we want to use that flexibility with all of you and whoever is funded, and we'll be negotiating those performance standards as we move forward. But um, we're trying to have as much flexibility as possible. So the way I came up with this funding example is I thought, um, what if we, what if four agencies scored really well and got funding. So I just did a fourth of the grant. And then I started looking at existing programs that have done similar work um, and how the categories might fit into um, eligible costs. So um, this one just shows if there was an award of 285,000, um, I put in a staff of a half-time staff person doing prevention navigation services and a point 10%, you know, 10% of a program manager or director providing support and assistance to that prevention navigator in the program. I, I threw in, you know, $4,000 for supplies, postage, telephone, you know, um, things that you need to support your staff to do the work, which um, then left um, about 200,000 for client assistance. Um, and then um, the uh, commerce allows up to 15% uh, to go towards admin. 
So I put that full amount in. Um, I do want to note that it I put up to that's what's allowed. You would have to show supporting documentation that you had costs that supported 15% um, being spent on admin for this program. Um, so it might be lower, but you could um, potentially um, budget for up to 15%. I do want to shout out to the Commerce and give them kudos. Um, they did something really wonderful for this funding source. They are allowing up to 15% admin. They're on top of that, they're allowing the county also to incur up to 15% admin. I, I want to be transparent. We're not going to probably take the 15% or are you any close to it. We will just be um, uh, taking a percentage to cover our costs for admin. But in previous grants, um, they've had the 15% as a shared between the county and our subrecipients. So we've had to share that amount. And for these funds, they're allowing both the subrecipient and the county to take up to that much. And so um, it, it we really appreciate that because it allows us to pass through 100% of the 15% to you, to you all if you need it. So, um, Kind of going backwards then, if you think about client assistant at $200,000, that's about $16,000 a month. So then I was thinking about like how many people you might serve with $16,000 a month. It's not a ton. And so just to kind of clarify, that's why I went to a 0.5 staffing position. I want to say I recognize a 0.5 staffing position can be difficult. So um, again, I'm not advocating for this. This was just my a scenario I came up with. Um, if you are an existing agency that does a variety of work, it may work that you have an existing staff person. Um, yes, um, Tom, the 10% um, de minimis is acceptable for this. Um, these aren't federal funds, but the state is allowing that. So it's a good question. And we'll go into more um, detail about that in some of the info sessions. But um, you could use a federally um, assigned indirect cost rate or the de minimis if you want to. Um, but uh, so I recognize the 0.5 FTE um, may not be the best way to go, but if, if depending on your program and your agency, it may be doable. And, and the reason I did that a little bit is because I thought I originally had a full FTE and um, and the only other place there were the money could really come out of is client assistance. And then so it dropped it, you know, another 40 grand. And then I kind of thought, I don't know if you would serve enough people with 160,000 a year and like, I don't know, 14 or 12,000 a month to have a full time, justify a full time FTE. So that's something we'll have to think about and talk through with you all. You know, we can't make those um, decisions of what you should apply for, but this is just an example. Um, again, we're, we're not going to give you any recommendations of what you can apply for, but I do want you to know that um, we know there's a, a variety of organizations. Um, that may be applying for these funds and community needs across our county. And um, there's only, you know, about a million dollars plus available. So um, I, I'm not, it's not likely it will all go to one agency. That's not our intent. Um, and so that's why I just did an example of a fourth, but we have no idea how many agencies will come in and how many will successfully be funded. Um, the funding decisions are made by an outside um, committee. It's called the Project Review Committee. Um, the county um, OCHS staff, we do not sit on that committee. Um, we just facilitate the RFP process. And so they will be making the final recommendations mm -hmm. on which projects are funded. Um, Any questions on this? Again, I, I want to point out some differences just in case. I, I can't remember if you've even pulled down the old RFP, but for instance, in the general population and young adult application, we're actually requiring that 80% um, of the grant go towards client assistance. So they are only being allowed 20% of the grant to go for staffing and admin combined. Um, we did this based on 
um, several years of budgets that we have access to for other similar programs and, and feel that's, um, that's reasonable and that our intent is really to get as much client assistance out in our community as possible. Um, we are not putting those restrictions at this time. We are not proposing to put those restrictions, and I don't see it coming in the RFP on a, 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 a minimum client assistance. We really want to work with the organizations um, um, that come in and to what works for them and what the needs are in, in the community. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much, Debbie. All right, so timeline. Um, we're excited to announce that the RFP, the request for proposals for this will be released on uh, May 9th. So you'll be able to see that on our website, as well as um, there's gonna be an email that goes out with the CHSI um, listserv. I will send an email out um, to anyone who is interested um, so if you are interested in hearing about the release of the RFP and all of the workshops, um, put your email address in the chat and I will add you to the email list um, if you're not already on it. We're also going to be doing three different workshops. So instead of doing one a technical assistance workshop, we're going to split it up. So the first one will be the Thursday after the RFP is released, and that's going to be a general um, workshop. So we're going to go over a little bit more detail about contracting requirements and reporting requirements. And then that following week on May 16th, we're going to have an application workshop that goes over the narrative of the application. The following week on May 23rd, we're going to have a workshop that just goes over the budget piece of the application. And then the application is going to be due on Tuesday, June 6th. So we're giving it four weeks from the time the RFP is released until the application is due. Um, and we're really excited to announce that that's that's happening. Um, I am going to share this application timeline with the list of um, folks who are interested that I have. So if you are interested and you put your email in the um, chat, then I will make sure to send this to you in the next day or so. Um, and then other ways to keep in contact with us. So you can email me directly at Natasha Doye um, at snowco.org, or you can join that listserv that I had talked about, the Community and Homeless Services Information Listserv, CHSI. If you're not already a part of that, I would highly suggest it because it's where we share a lot of our um, uh, funding opportunities. There's also a lot of um, resources within the community. Um, and so I highly recommend that. Uh, also our website. So I'm excited. We have a website right now um, that is available online. And I thought I had a link to it and I did not have a link ready for it. So let me grab that link really fast. Um, does anyone have any additional questions? I think, can I just add one thing? Thank you, Natasha. This was really helpful. Um, this is, you know, we are trying to do things a little differently because we understand from, you know, uh, uh, some of the early interest we've had from agencies when we kind of mentioned the buy-in for um, uh, organization RFP with the, the original RFP that went out for the general population, we recognize that there may be agencies that are coming in that haven't contracted um, with the county before, or at least in our homeless housing section or received funding. So that's kind of why we're structuring things a little differently and having more workshops and spreading out the time a little bit. And so the only other thing I want to add is, and it, it obviously it's going to be on the website and, and, but, you know, in addition to those three workshops, you can always contact Natasha and she can also provide you technical assistance. Because I know sometimes you have very specific questions about your organization or agency and you may not want to ask them in a, in a, in a public um, forum, so to speak. So you can always um, 
reach out to myself or Natasha probably is the best, but, um, and she can provide a one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. You know, we, like, again, we can't like help you write the application or, you know, give you really specific um, suggestions, but we can definitely answer questions. And, and we, during the RFP process, we, um, we typically um, summarize Q and A's that we receive that are applicable to everyone so that everyone has the same information and it's shared. So um, just so you know, we're going to, try to offer lots of different ways um, to be a, a good resource through this process. All right, and the website, uh, like I said, will have the RFP when it's released. It will have um, the recording of this conversation, um, it will have the slideshow, and then as we go through the additional workshops, um, the website will also have the recordings of the three workshops and the slides as well. You are so welcome, Damari. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. If you guys don't have any more questions, then I'm going to stop the recording.